You'll notice in the first video that I set out reflective practice as a deliberate, considered act separate from experience that takes place after the action upon which you reflect. While this form of retrospective reflection is good practice to increase your intentionality, we should also recognize that most reflection takes place constantly, usually unintentionally. Humans are constantly creating and testing knowledge, usually in community with others. We may also engage in anticipatory reflection, reflection on phenomenon and action in a future situation. Anticipatory reflection can help us be proactive in approaching the needs of our clients to avoid bias. For example, we might know that a client affected by schizophrenia without access to medication may experience memory problems or atypical emotional responses. Anticipatory reflection would allow a student to consider this possibility rather than jumping to the conclusion that, for example, the client is lying. That leads us to our next question, why reflective practice? Michelle Leering's work is useful here. She divides the goals of reflection into five categories. First, she argues that reflection improves practice, essentially by applying what the actor learns through reflection on professional, academic, and experiential knowledge to new situations. As she says, just doing it better. Arlene Dodge demonstrates how reflection on practice has improved her lawyering in instrumental ways. You need to be able to listen and you need to be able to um, have a conversation with people so that when they identify something that you can come back and say, is this what you mean from, you, from what you're telling me? Is this um, so you're rephrasing information? So you really have to listen well. So you can't be on a phone checking messages, you need to really tune into that person. You need to be in the moment. Ryan Fritsch describes his experience. So uh, the clinic was uh, integrally important in the formation of my skills as a lawyer. There were the very concrete skills that you learn, you know, how to do legal research, um, how to write a factum, uh, how to go through the procedural steps to get uh, something heard at court. Uh, how to communicate with opposing counsel. I learned all that. That was important stuff. Uh, but what I really learned was how to work with people uh, and how working with your client is uh, so important to being a good advocate for them. Uh, I learned that uh, you can't just put a client in a box and say, oh, you've got a housing issue? Well, this is how we deal with housing issues. Or you have an access to a social entitlement issue? This is how we deal with that. Uh, every client is different. Every story is different. Uh, so one of the big things I learned at the uh, clinic was uh, how to communicate, how to make clients feel safe, how to talk to them about their rights and make it something that's real to them and something that they see that they can activate and uh, enjoy, uh, just like anyone else. Uh, also learned that uh, you can't just see clients as a transactional relationship, that you have to build a relationship with the client. And that uh, if you don't take the time to build that relationship, uh, you're going to let your client down. You might be able to help them with the single issue that they come into the office for, uh, but you're not going to help them learn about their other rights uh, that they can act on or help identify some of the other legal issues that might be in their life. Uh, and um, you know, if you're not doing that, uh, you're not uh, going all the way as an advocate. Second, Leering argues that improving practice through critical perspectives can deepen understanding of the operation of power and ideology to advance social justice goals. Third, reflection may lead to transformational learning and action. Ryan's comments demonstrate both these goals. The way that my uh, sort of understanding or appreciation for the clinic system evolved was that one, uh, it showed me that law could be a force for change. Uh, but it also opened up the horizon of how I might want to practice law, right? Uh, so I was interested in working with that individual client on that individual issue. But I saw how it was connected to other issues and how uh, that client's experience was similar to other clients who were denied uh, justice. Uh, so that opened up a whole realm of uh, systemic and public interest law uh, that, again, I sort of had a notional idea about, uh, but actually seeing it and talking to clients collectively and bringing collective uh, cases forward to provoke systemic change uh, was definitely something that I, uh, I came to understand and really enjoy doing. And that's what I'm doing now uh, every day in my practice 10 years later. 
Fourth, Leering states that reflection may lead to questions about the relationship-based nature of power and knowledge, how structures cannot be separated from the actions that occur inside them. In this way, context is everything. Solange discussed this earlier. Lastly, Leering notes that in professional practice, the personal may be more deeply tied to a professional ethical and moral practice through reflection, potentially increasing personal satisfaction and wellness. I think each client that I worked with, I remember. I I remember their names. I remember their faces. I remember what their legal issues were. And with each client, there's just always something that stands out as being really rewarding, whether it was just even in a moment of connection about talking about a systemic issue or talking about their legal issue or um, feeling like something you said helped or whether it was in court getting a good result or getting a charge withdrawn. I think with every client, you always there's always something memorable and something that I learned um, from a particular person and took away from it. You've now seen several former students demonstrate critical reflection, but still struggle with exactly how to get started. Chapman and Anderson emphasize the importance of setting a goal for your practice and choosing a method that works for you. You should also assess what you have learned from your reflective practice and adjust it if it's not working for you. However, most important is acting on what you have learned through reflection. To get started on reflection on action, ask yourself, what did I do? How did I do it? How can I improve next time? And what steps will I need to take to improve? You have some basic steps. So when should you reflect? Opportunities to reflect are everywhere in the clinic setting. How about after you interview a client? When you have done a community presentation? When you lose a case? When you learn something in class that relates to your clinic work? When a new piece of legislation is passed that will impact your clients? And before case rounds? I've talked a lot about the positive aspects of clinical experience and reflection, but it's important to keep in mind a few cautionary notes. First, it's important to consider how reflection can also lead to the disciplining of knowledge and experience. Surface reflection may also result simply in the reification of social and political structures, encouraging or discouraging particular ways of knowing, doing, and feeling. It's also important to note that some parts of experiences will always be rendered invisible or unimportant. It could be something the student thinks would be unacceptable to make public, or perhaps the deeply ingrained social or political structure remains hidden, or perhaps the very act of a public or semi-public reflection encourages people to hide. Reflection in professional practice also tends to be very cognitive-focused. Experience, however, is visceral. It's felt as well as thought. It's difficult to capture this in formal assessments of reflection. We try very hard to structure reflection in our clinical experiences in ways that support deep, critical reflection. And we're always reflecting on how to do this better. So if you have suggestions, I'm more than happy to hear from you.